So since we're kind of on the subject of structure of the cartels, how they recruit, I've never really gotten into how how prevalent are the cartels outside of Mexico's borders. Are they setting up shop here in the U.S.? Are they setting up shop in places like Honduras, El Salvador, Colombia, Peru, Venezuela, you know, Guatemala, Panama, or or are they staying in Mexico? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, they, they're huge in the United States. I mean, they're massive. Uh, they operate in the United States very differently than Mexico. So it's like kind of attack and defense, that kind of difference. Okay. But they're all over. I mean, they're pretty much in every, I would say they're probably in every state in the United States, uh, in some way operating, connecting. So, so what does that mean? Like, whereas in Mexico, uh, you know, you have, you know, Sinaloa, Culiacán, you know, you have hundreds of gunmen on standby all the time, ready to jump on stuff, policing things, policing labs, in a bunch of businesses, um, ready to kidnap people, shake people down, kill people at will. Here they're very different. Or traditionally they have been. So there's been a few times, if you look over the years, when they started dropping bodies in the United States. One was over in Texas when the Setas started killing a bunch of people in South Texas in the 2000s. One was over in California around the San Diego area when a break off from the Ariana Felix cartel started killing a bunch of people. A group called Los Palillos. Both times, law enforcement hit them very hard. So they kind of learned this lesson. Okay, in the United States, we can make billions of dollars. But there's certain things we don't want to do. We don't want to kill too many people. Sometimes even they're better off kidnapping somebody in the United States. It might be a, it might be a Mexican national anyway, or it could be somebody from here. Driving them into Mexico and committing the murder over there. Really? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Particularly on the El Paso Juarez border. You've got this group called the Barrio Azteca, who are a cross-border organization working with the Juarez cartel. Began as a prison gang in Texas and grew and basically became a paramilitary organization. But they're also very active in Texas. And they kidnap people, drive into Mexico and kill them in Mexico, drop you know, another body in, in Juarez. Because, you know, look, think about the investigation. In, in Juarez in 2010, there was 3,000 murders. In El Paso, there was like 12. Wow. So, like, you're going to dump it in Juarez and it becomes one of 3,000, you know, murders not investigated or have it in El Paso where it can be, like, investigated. So they, they learned a lesson over the years of, okay, we don't kill people in the same way. You know, we don't, we're not going to do all these crazy kind of beheadings, but they're all here. And unless they're going to be killing police officers like they do in Mexico every day, in you know, Mexico they can kill police officers if they're not on their payroll. Here in the United States, it's more difficult. Now, I'll give a butt to that. Historically, that's been the case. With the way law enforcement in the United States is right now, demoralized, losing uh, officers, is that always going to be the case? Yeah, I see where you're... You're talking about the defund the police movement, how well, that's shaked out. Yeah, what's happening in the United States? I mean, I talk to officers here in the United States, talk to agencies in the United States. They're pretty much demoralized. Not only the police departments, an anti-narcotics officer pretty demoralized in many cases, also a lot of the federal agencies, a lot of these, these DA agents. Like There's this just a general malaise. A lot of people are fed up with their organizations mm -hmm. in many cases. Now, will they have the same way of hitting these cartels very hard? Will they always last? I don't know. I would say cartels are only getting stronger here over the years. Now, what does it really mean how they're operating here? Say if you look at, um, um, you, they, they drive drugs in from Mexico into the United States and have hubs, hub cities. Los Angeles, Phoenix, Houston, up in Chicago, these can be hubs. They drive a bunch of drugs up there, then they move them around and they go down the chain to smaller towns. What's happened over the years, you've seen a change, like first you had the Colombians trafficking a lot of drugs into the United States, cocaine. Then the Colombians were paying Mexicans to traffic the drugs themselves. Like say, the, the Colombians were bringing the cocaine in back in the 1980s, flying it right into Florida. Then that was shut down with the uh, Miami Task Force. 
um, Florida task, you know, anti-drug task force, Navy ships, all that kind of stuff. They kind of made it more difficult to bring drugs, fly them right over the Caribbean from Colombia into Florida. So the Colombians turned to Mexico and the Mexican cartels were already moving weed and heroin. And they said, okay, we're going to pay you to traffic cocaine for us. We give it to you in Colombia or we give it to you in Panama or somewhere in Central America and you move that up and deliver it to us in the United States and we, we sell it. And the Colombians a lot of the time were wholesalers. They wholesale the United States, uh, wholesale cocaine in the United States, then it goes down and uh, all different, you know, different people get involved. Then they start paying the Mexicans and then the Mexicans say, well, we want a piece of this. So for a while it was like, we own this cocaine between us 50-50. Then the Mexicans, in the end, just started buying the cocaine from the Colombians, just buy off you in Colombia for a couple of thousand bucks a key, and we can move it ourselves and make the profits ourselves. So you had the Mexicans becoming the, the, the cartels that would move the cocaine and be the wholesalers. But then you see another change. You start seeing, and you saw this first with a group called La Familia Michoacana, and then the Jalisco New Generation cartel. You saw a whole other groups of immigrant communities in the 2000s. Michoacan and Jalisco, particularly large numbers of immigrants across the whole United States. So whereas before the you know, Mexicans would bring it into Los Angeles, you know, bunch of cocaine, bunch of drugs, sell it to people, it would get to these small towns gradually. They started creating networks in these small towns. So suddenly all these places, you know, you know, it's, it's sad to say because the, the vast majority of Mexicans are very hardworking migrants in these places. But within and kind of piggybacking off these migrant communities, you've got dealers setting up shops in these, shops in these places. Uh, so suddenly you've got a spread of networks all over the place, all over the country. And then, you know, you have dealers in, you know, the Midwest, in, in, you know, in, in small towns in the Midwest with direct lines to the Jalisco cartel. Okay. Now, still, they're like, okay, they're, they're, they're moving drugs. So they're with the main activities. Moving drugs around the country, distributing them. Still, often, they'll go right down to kind of kilo level, and then like the street dealers can be, can be a mix of people. Moving the money and collecting the money, laundering the money, or moving the money back to Mexico, and acquiring firearms and taking them to Mexico as well. Some of the key operations are what the cartels are doing here. Now they're not they're not like in Mexico involved in, you know, like uh, you know, our and, and and the human smuggling and bringing people to the United States and the networks as well because they're not only bringing them into the, crossing the border of the United States. When you pay that money, that will allow you to go to any you know any city you want. You could be going to your family in Atlanta to work and you're paying your ticket there. So they've got very significant operations. Now you know, what does that mean in the future? I'd be concerned. Mm -hmm. um, seeing Mexico, seeing how, how these organized crime in Mexico, you know, really tears it apart, I'd be concerned about what this means in the future. I mean, to me, I think the biggest concern would be them intermingling in our, in our politics mm. and <clears throat> infiltrating the police departments, mm. the military, the border patrol, DEA, FBI, all of them, you know? Do you think, because I have heard that they are specifically sending guys into the military to get trained, then come back, come out, and then train the cartels, the U.S. military tactics. I don't see why that wouldn't be true. Yeah, so... so First, in terms of infiltrating stuff, you've, you've already got, we've already got a track record of certain police officers, certain uh, officials working with the cartels. Uh, and it, it, I mean, it can be different things. I got, got one interview I did with a guy who was working for the cartel, an American guy here working for the cartel, who was uh, working for actually a cable company laying cable, but he had a government ID. And he had a government idea to go back and forth over the border. Now, he was shifted guns for them, shifted firearms from the United States to, Tex to, from the United States to Mexico using a government ID. And also, he then got involved in it. He was like driving around laying cables. He had scanners and he was 
following the border patrol and giving all this information to the cartel. And he was, he said, I mean, he was doing it for the money, but also he's kind of doing it for a thrill as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was like surprised how clumsy the border patrol. He was, he said it was like clumsy. They're kind of giving away a lot of stuff. It's very easy for me to locate all this stuff. And I'm giving that to the cartel, so the cartel knows and, and, and operates this stuff. Now you also got cases of cops um, in some of the border towns in the U.S. side, and some border patrol agents who have been have been caught working with the, with the cartels. And there, there, there's cases um, out there. Uh, I think it's obviously a, a far smaller level than Mexico, but it's it's still out there and it's something to be concerned about. In terms of getting military instruction for the cartels, you've seen um, US vets recruited by the cartels. Uh, how are they recruiting them? Like how how are they are they getting to them? How are they mm-hmm. finding them for recruitment? Um, some some of them some of the cases that I've seen of solid cases have been Mexican Mexican Americans who have been in some cases even deported for any other reasons even though they've been in the military they've messed up or something the papers commit some crime afterwards and end up being deported so they're back in those kind of networks in Mexico and they're, and they're like you know, obviously got very sellable skills but there have been, there's also some cases of kind of US, you know, American military guys. I'm not sure exactly how, how what the outreach would be, like exactly who the connections are. I mean, um, a lot, of, you know, it may be in some of the kind of mercenary security circles. Uh, there's, there's there's definitely like a lot of cartels are hungry for ex-military people from whatever. So you know, it used to, a few years ago, they would actually advertise and they had like, like um, actually they'd hang up blankets writing like, you know, are you military or ex-military? You know, oh, man. We'll hire you. In Mexico, we'll hire you. You know, don't ride to the bus. You know, don't ride, you know, ride bus, the bus to the work. Um, you know, we'll hire you. We're, we're looking. Have a, have a better life for you and your children. Um, you get Colombian, some Colombian ex-military, Guatemalan ex-military. Um, you know, when people find out, you know, get away, you know, we'll, you know we'll, we'll pay for that expertise. Wow. Do you think they're intermingling in our politics yet? Uh, I haven't seen that in terms of U.S. politicians like, uh, like, yeah, I mean, and in, in Mexico, you know, there, there's a huge capture of, of politics by drug cartels. So we could talk about narco politics, narco politicians. I mean, it would be, I'm not going to say it would be simple, but China is definitely involved in American politics. I don't see why the cartels, I mean, they're obviously intertwined, you mm-hmm. know, somewhat. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the way it is in I mean in Mexico. Um, so in Mexico, that's also evolved the way they're running politics in Mexico. So for a long time, it was like the cartel bribes, you know, a mayor bribes a police chief to move. Then the cartels get stronger. And they start to get more powerful at a local level than, than mayors and police chiefs. And they start to say, you have to work for us. And we're going to take 10% of your budget. So like 10% of the city budget has to go to the cartel. This is a bunch of towns across Mexico. And then you see cases where they start working with the bigger party at a federal level. Then they start saying, okay, we'll deliver votes for you. So we'll use our armed groups to be intimidating people to vote for you. Uh, you know, and, 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 and then you have also kind of cutting out the middle man and actually have cartel guys themselves who are really the politicians, who are really the, the kind of gangsters who get into politics. I mean, famously, obviously Pablo Escobar, you know, ran for Congress. And, um, so you see, you see that, that reach and that power and that influence. Now at a U.S., level and I haven't seen it 
Um, it's it's possible in the long term, definitely. It's something to watch out for. Uh, and you've got to watch out for this stuff. You can start at like local levels. And then, but it, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, I mean, in terms of, so in terms of China, you know, they're, 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 they're working together, but like, you know, to, to think about strategically about like how you, you know, like how you'd actually start taking over politicians or, or bribing or paying money to their campaigns. I mean, it's possible these guys are moving a lot of money. Uh, they're obviously buying a, some of them buying a lot of real estate in the United States. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.